Um, why don't we get started? Welcome everybody to the Internet Advocacy Roundtable. Uh, my name is Alan Rosenblatt. Uh, I am the co-founder along with Suzanne Turner, Turner Strategies, of the Roundtable. We've been doing this since August of 2005. And we bring to you uh, uh, events, bringing uh, expert speakers, talking about the uh, intersection of the internet and social media with politics, advocacy, and uh, the media, especially with respect to public affairs. Uh, today we're going to be talking about innovations in online advertising. Uh, we have a great panel today of uh, um, experts uh, from three of the companies that are doing some of the most innovative work in uh, really taking targeting advertising to a whole new level. Uh, to my left is Waldo Tibbetts. Uh, Waldo is, uh, was an early pioneer in electronic publishing and online media. He's worked for some of the best known media companies in the business. Uh, he's held senior sales and top sales management roles at Congressional Quarterly, Legislate. Uh, later on, he was at Washington Post, Newsweek Interactive. Uh, he's been at Politico, Politicker. Uh, he's got, uh, he had his own consulting firm called Here's Waldo, Here's Waldo uh, Consulting, consulting. Uh, <laughs> in case anybody was trying to find Waldo. Uh, and uh, was working at TPM, uh, Talking Points Memo for a while, and now is at Rocket Fuel and will be telling us a, a bit about what the innovations are going on at Rocket Fuel. Uh, to his left is Jordan Lieberman. Uh, Jordan Lieberman, when I met him, was the uh, publisher of Campaigns and Elections magazine and has since gone on to uh, uh, become president of uh, Campaign Grid, which is uh, a, uh, another one of these innovative, cutting-edge online advertising platforms focusing on campaigns and advocacy type of, uh, of clients. Uh, and he's going to tell us a lot about, about that. And then once we get him up online, uh, we'll have Jim Walsh. Uh, Jim Walsh is a founding partner at DS Political, which uh, some would describe as sort of the, uh, the uh, progressive or democratic counterpart to Campaign Grid. Uh, and uh, Jim is currently at Netroots Nation in San Jose, uh, California, and will be joining us via Google Hangout uh, as soon as he's able to get his connections up and running. I uh, want to thank our sponsors for the event. Uh, we have CARE2, uh, who, along with League of Conservation Voters, provides us with the room. CARE2 uh, helps out with, with, with the food and is our longtime partner on, on, on hosting this. Uh, we Act Radio, who provides the uh, streaming video uh, for the event. Uh, we Act Radio is, in addition to being progressive radio here in D.C. at 1480 a.m. and online at weactradio.com, they also provide streaming video services for progressive events uh, that want to do things e no matter where they are. If they're out on the street, you've got a rally, you've got a protest, you've got a march, uh, you've got a concert. Uh, they can set up a really affordable and great um, live streaming services, and, and they provide us the live streaming services as a sponsor. Uh, and Turner Strategies, which is a communications PR firm, I'm a partner there, and uh, Suzanne, as I mentioned, Sir Suzanne Turner is the co-founder of the Internet Advocacy Roundtable from way back in 2005. And unfortunately, she could not make it today, but uh, I think she's off at Netroots as well. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, the speakers, Jim, Jordan, and then, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Waldo, Jordan, and then Jim. They're going to speak for about 10 minutes each, and then we're going to open it up to discussion. We should have a, a lot of time for discussion. We're here till 2 o'clock. And uh, if you are live tweeting it, uh, please use the IAR hashtag, pound IAR. Uh, and if you want to follow the roundtable itself on Twitter, uh, that's the IA roundtable is the Twitter account. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Waldo. All right. Well, thank you, Alan. It's good to um, it's good to see some industry veterans and lots of uh, familiar faces and a lot of new faces. So I appreciate you all joining us today, and uh, looking forward to having a, a lively conversation about <coughs> about uh, what's going on in the world of uh, issue advocacy and political communications. Um, I'm going to, because we only have a relatively short period of time, I'm going to uh, start from a, a, an appropriately high level, uh, but I'm going to go a whole lot higher than the 30,000 foot view, which, which everybody starts at. Um, and we're starting here with what I hope is a comforting picture for everybody, and that is, you know, showing our home. Um, but I'm going to start with something that's a little bit more appropriate to uh, rocket fuel. Uh, now, rocket fuel is a company that 
I'm, I'm guessing that um, um, most of you probably have not heard of, and that's okay. Uh, hopefully by the end of our, our conversation today, you'll have a pretty good sense of what the company is doing and why it's creating such a buzz. But I start here about 140 million miles from Earth because this is really where rocket fuel began. Rocket fuel's um, heritage really is uh, born out of uh, uh, kind of a marriage that was made in heaven uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, it was uh, a very uh, timely coming together of people from the business world and from the tech world. And uh, um, you'll see here that uh, what we've got is something of, of where we draw our, uh, our team from, where, where, where we have our bench, where we've got uh, our corporate headquarters. We're, at, we're headquartered in um, Silicon Valley, right in the midst of everything. In fact, we're, our, our offices are right across the street from Oracle's world's head, world headquarters. But the company came together in 2008, um, and again, it came together uh, along a very, very simple premise. And that premise was to find ways to address um, what was one of the big conundrums for marketing professionals uh, over the years, and that is, you know, just how to deliver the right message to the right person at exactly the right time to get them to do, hopefully, exactly what you're looking for them to do. Um, it's easy to say, uh, as you all no doubt know, I mean, it's, it's dramatically harder uh, than it sounds, but with that premise, this is what this is um, what gave birth to the company in 2008. The first couple of years, the company was around, was really spent in a build-out mode. Um, they had to obviously do a proof of concept, and that proof of concept was to show that they could build a platform that actually delivered on, on the promises. So how does, how does the whole Mars rover thing fit into it? Well, as you can see uh, right here, uh, NASA is sort of at the top of our, our uh, chart of uh, organizations that we pull from. And in fact, a lot of the very same engineers and uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, PhDs who built the Mars rover AI program are in fact actually working at rocket fuel. So those people have built the AI system, which is really sort of central to uh, to our platform. Beyond that, again, we obviously pulled from a lot of sort of the Silicon Valley uh, tech darlings and a lot of the people uh, from the business side um, who have sort of rounded out the organization. So I'm going to talk just for a second here. Uh, this is something that all of us probably know, and, and uh, uh, you know we've all been living through it for the past 15, 20 years. Uh, as, as Alan mentioned, I, I came from the content side, worked with a lot of different publishers here in Washington, so that was really sort of my background. I kind of missed the, uh, the period where um, we got into audience targeting, and that's, that's uh, uh, obviously a, sort of a, a, an era or a period that we're still in, in in many ways. But where we're going is, is really the whole notion of uh, results-driven advertising, and, and that's really what I hope to touch upon in more detail with what, uh, what Rocket Fuel is, is doing these days. And again, sort of the core of what's, what's creating so much interest uh, in, our, in our technology. So the, um, the, the question always comes up for us, and, 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 I, and I would again imagine that, that all of you probably are wondering, it's like, wow, okay, it sounds like you know, this, is, um, this is rocket science for digital advertising, and it is. Um, but I want to try to explain it in some simpler terms, because everybody wa always wants to put you in buckets. They want to you know, see what you look like in order to figure out what you do and you know, who exactly you are. So we often have heard this, um, people will say, well, are you a network or are you a DSP? Well, the truth of the matter is that we're actually, um, we're actually the best of both worlds. We are not a network. We are actually a network of all the networks. In fact, we reach 99.4% of all of the internet audience out there across all digital media platforms. So there isn't a network that I know of that, that has that sort of reach. Uh, say perhaps uh, the Google Ad Exchange. So uh, we are network <coughs> network like in some regards, but um, we've we've gone well beyond that. Same thing with with being a DSP. I mean, we have enormous amounts of technology. Uh, it's one of the things I think is a like a massive eye opener for people when they see the technology that the company has built here. 
Um, but what we've really brought together and, and uh, brought into the digital advertising space is a level of technology which truly has not been seen before. Um, not my words, these are words that uh, have been used to describe the company, and, and that is that uh, the company is really revolutionary uh, as opposed to being an evolutionary type of company. Uh, and that's, that's kind of cool, frankly, to be able to work for a company that's really taken such a big step forward. So I think the, uh, the thing that, that uh, is differentiating us is all the stuff in the blue in the middle here because, again, we have a lot of capabilities that are very network-like and, and obviously a lot of capabilities very DSP-like as well. Um, just a little bit of information about the company. Uh, again, we, we uh, were a small company just a couple of years ago. We're growing at an enormous pace. Uh, in fact, we're the fastest growing company in the ad tech space um, by a large margin. Uh, this is a company that um, is growing at this pace on the basis of all of its operating income. It's not done on the basis of, of um, you know, anything other than the business that we're actually working on. So we have become a comprehensive platform really to uh, deliver on this holy grail for advertisers across the digital, the video, the mobile, and the social landscape. And to do it in a, in a, uh, a combined, in a um, comprehensive fashion, which uh, distills the learnings from every one of those channels as, as uh, we work and move forward. Uh, one thing worth noting, and, and um, just just to give you guys a, a sense that uh, this is a technology that has legs, that obviously it's working and, and, and doing everything that it's promised uh, to do. And Forbes magazine, at the end of 2011, placed rocket fuel at number 22 on its uh, top 100 most promising companies in America. At the end of 2012, uh, rocket fuel rocketed to number four. So we're real proud of the fact that we you obviously have to really pass some serious litmus tests to be able to uh, say that. But uh, just to give a sort of a sense of the scope and scale, the types of organizations we work with, 83 of the top 100 national advertisers are already utilizing the platform here. This gives a sense of how fast the company is growing uh, and the scale that uh, uh, we're bringing to the marketplace. Uh, and, and frankly, this slide was not more than a month old, and it's already way out of date. Um, we are currently at over 410 people. We're slated to be at close to 800 people by the end of the year. So you all can do the quick math on that. That's a doubling of size at already a pretty impressive um, uh, level. The 94% uh, renewal rate is something that, again, we're very proud of because at the end of the day, for us, it's all about, obviously, the technology. But more important than the technology is the results that we're delivering and the fact that uh, we want to essentially create fans, stark raving fans for everybody that uh, works with us. So we're real proud of the fact that um, this level of people renew. And then the 229% uh, is actually a study that Forrester did which talked about for agencies that deploy and use uh, rocket fuel, uh, they, they have a you know pretty hefty uh, return on their investment. And if anybody's watching what's going on on Wall Street today, you know, you'd love to have this sort of uh, return on, on uh, your investment any day. So the world as we view it is sort of in pretty stark contrast. The stuff that uh, is on the left here is the world as we have known it. The world on the right is the world that we are trying to create. Um, and, and basically what, you know, the way we sort of look at this, the dichotomy is that uh, up until this point it was advertising that ran meaning, you know, especially in the digital space, you had to put together campaigns where even a modestly complex uh, campaign required you to call people who are contextual partners, portals, uh, endemic websites, like the ones that we have all over Washington. You know, you would have perhaps a half a dozen or 10 different phone calls to make to partners to try to put your campaign together. Um, the synthesis that we are bringing to the marketplace is the fact that all these technologies have been basically merged into, into one single platform, and we are now at uh, very much sort of the DNA level, uh, analyzing, evaluating, running these campaigns, and helping advertisers actually learn exactly what is causing their campaigns to perform uh, and, and, um, and why. Um, I don't expect anybody, uh, I probably wouldn't even be able to see it if I turned around here, so I don't expect you to see this, but uh, where we are going as a company, 
uh, is, is certainly not where we are today. Um, this, this is, uh, again, just sort of giving a bit of a flow chart showing some of the massive things that are taking place. A couple of things that, uh, if anybody can see this, we talk about our data warehouse from where we started. We are currently at six petabytes worth of data, which really comes down to there's 25,000 audience segments that we have built, uh, custom audience segments that are targetable for all of our advertisers. Uh, and we've grown to, and again, this slide is way out of date. We're probably just under 2 billion uh, audience profiles worldwide at this point. So what that fundamentally means is that everybody in this room uh, has been profiled by us, and you are known to us in no, not, in no personally identifiable way, of course. I have to say this all sort of post-NSA um, bruja, but uh, none of this stuff, everything that I'm talking about is obviously this is, you know, non-PII focused, but this just gives you a sense of how rapidly the company is scaling. And what we're doing is, is really sort of moving from being uh, more of a tactical provider of solutions to, to a strategic uh, partner for our clients. Um, for everybody, uh, you know, anybody that's in this business, there are a couple of terms that get thrown around pretty liberally. Uh, chief, of, chief amongst them is the concept of big data, and uh, we are no different. Um, this is not what distinguishes rocket fuel. Um, it is what rocket fuel is, is certainly built on, and it is an important component for the, the uh, platform that we've built. As you can see here, we are connected um, uh, at, again, an integral and almost on a DNA level with over 30 partners um, in, in the data space, many of which you know, you're probably uh, very, very familiar with. The big difference that uh, Rocket Fuel has is that you know, unlike some, some arrangements that other companies in this space have where they get periodic updates, we are connected literally in real time to all of these companies and we are uh, in real time continuously updating every one of those 25,000 audience segments in those nearly 2 billion audience profiles as we run these campaigns. So this kind of gives you a sense of some of the companies that, uh, that we're with just in general. Now looking at um, companies that are in the, in, the, in the sort of the political and the advocacy space, um, this is not a representative list necessarily. This gives you just a couple of them. Um, in fact, I did a little more granular scan of uh, our partnerships. We've actually got 15 different companies that provide us just an extraordinary amount of depth when it comes to uh, all forms of political, uh, all forms of political um, uh, information, whether it's whether it's interest, whether it's voting patterns, whether it's uh, you know financial information. I mean, it's just an amazing amount, and certainly happy to share that with anybody again, on a more granular level if, uh, if you're interested. Um, so a couple of the things that, that uh, have, have made the Rocket Fuel platform what it is, I always sort of talk about it as a platform, and I refer to it uh, in an analogy as, as a table. And if you imagined a massive table as big as this, this room, in fact, this room would be a good one, um, what sits on the table are all of the targeting techniques that are available to all digital advertisers. So every form of digital targeting that you can do uh, sits on the Rocket Fuel platform and works in an interoperable way and works very synergistically. So we are not limited to targeting demographically or behaviorally or psychographic or bisographics or you know technical uh, targeting. We have access to all that sort of stuff. But more importantly, we add to it the fact that all of our uh, campaigns run uh, very much on a data-driven basis. So uh, I always say it's like, you know, cookies can crumble, um, data doesn't, uh, and data doesn't lie. When you look at this stuff and when you can kludge this much information together, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. The, um, the second, so, so I always sort of put that in as a, as a call it a, one of the big pillars that supports our platform are these massive big data partnerships. On the other end, of that platform though sit our massive supply pipelines and this gives you sort of a sense this is not a comprehensive list either but rocket fuel sits on basically all of the ad exchanges that exist out there in the display the video the mobile uh, and in the social world just we're integrated in as one of the preferred partners with uh, Facebook but what this gives us the ability to do as I mentioned earlier is reach well over 99 percent of the US internet population across all of those platforms at any point in time and when we talk about being able to reach these people we will see them somewhere between 500 to 700 times 
a month on average. Uh, and again, all that information has, has been built into anonymized profiles of the audiences, which gives us the ability to, uh, to reach them. So the third thing that uh, beyond the big data partnerships and the massive supply pipelines that runs the rocket fuel platform is our real-time bidding, our programmatic buying capability. This is, um, this is sort of the heart of the machine. It's, um, it's incredibly robust. Uh, industrial strength uh, kind of comes to mind as a term that uh, probably best describes it. But our RTB system, uh, in concert with the AI capability that is running the entire platform, gives us the ability to marry up the massive data profiles and data uh, models with this massive supply to find exactly the audiences so that we are really delivering on kind of that one-to-one -one, um, you know, uh, metric that, that uh, advertisers have so long sought um, you know, in, in, uh, in marketing. So this is, uh, this is really what we look at uh, when we talk about the RTB system. We are buying, we are evaluating and buying over 26 billion impressions a month, or excuse me, a day, um, and we are buying those impressions one at a time. So that's a lot of impressions, obviously, in the course of, of uh, a day. But more impressive even than the number of uh, impressions that we're buying and serving on our uh, various campaigns is the fact that we will literally analyze every single impression up to 11 million different ways, and we do that in the blink of an eye. Uh, this is helping us figure out whether all of the <clears throat> factors align for whether um, you know this is the right place to buy this particular ad to serve it to this particular person in this context et cetera et cetera et cetera and again this happens all uh, in nanoseconds so literally before pages load or before <clears throat> you see the first thing on your mobile device or your uh, or your tablet so anyway these are just a few of the things that uh, we actually look at I'm going to jump through just a couple things. We can talk about this much quick, or much more in depth. The advocacy solutions that we have, again, this is way, there's way too much here to talk about in depth, but everybody's got an advocacy solution um, that's, that's here today. We've got a number of different products that um, we can dig into, uh, and we'll do that a little bit later. What am I doing for time? Are we going to wrap? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead, and uh, I'm just going to wrap this up. These are all things that we can look at a little bit more. And one of the things I'll close with is the fact that because it isn't about, it isn't just about the fact that the technology is there and that we can pull this stuff together, it's that we actually are learning everything about what is driving the success of your campaigns. We are automatically optimizing to whatever your objective is. And one of the things that we hear from people all the time is um, <clears throat> the fact that we can deliver to them a level of actionable information about who their most responsive audiences are that they've just never frankly seen before. Uh, and again, we can do that because we are literally vacuuming out of the environment uh, absolutely everything about what's going on with these campaigns and why they're working. So um, anyway, I'll end on this. This is the thing that we're talking about, and we can get into that uh, in, in a bit more detail later. Great. OK, thank, thank you. you. Yep. Sorry, Jim. It's going away, I guess. Can you all see? Say goodbye, Jim. <coughs> Hi, Jim. Say goodbye. I'm trying Hi, to run over. <laughs> Leave the camera so you can see. Oh, no, I need it. Oh, for, you need it. Okay. Yeah. Bring you back in a minute, I promise. <coughs> so this is my um, I'll, I'll be, do this, this is my um, fifth presentation in three weeks, and I just couldn't bring myself to use the same PowerPoint again. So I started from scratch, knowing that I was uh, talking to a relatively sophisticated audience, and um, filled ten pages with pretty pictures because I couldn't do this one more time <laughs> for an hour. Um, we don't want to look at Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, hold on. Sorry about that. That's fixable. There we go. Close. Is he going to make some edits? 
<laughs> cool. Okay. So um, that's my logo. Um, Jordan was campaign grid. I was um, uh, very briefly um, been with campaign grid for three and a half years. I was employee number seven. We're approaching uh, about 40 employees now. Um, I think where we fit in is that we were the first to develop this platform, a data-driven platform, uh, with the national online voter file for people in politics and public affairs. So we're in that space. Um, uh, we've delivered thousands of campaigns. Uh, we worked um, through our with our data sets on, I think, every presidential campaign in the last cycle. Um, we uh, engaged in, I think, about 500 program engagements, about 500 engagements last year. Um, it will be on pace for about that this year, if not a little bit more. Um, where we fit in is that we are kind of a, a middle market, if not a whole, kind of a wholesaler. That, so we are almost never on FEC reports or, or similar reports. We typically work only for political consultants, sh uh, associations, um, large agencies, things like that. Um, I promised Alan not to brag about campaign grid, so we'll do that for <laughs> 10 seconds and we'll move on. Um, <laughs> so what we, what we do is um, we take three different kinds of data. We take our data, which is the national online voter file, um, the voter file coming from a couple different sources, but uh, the, the same places where political consultants and public affairs professionals are using their, getting their uh, direct mail and phone files. That's where we get our national online voter file data. We're not modeling it. We're not making it up from commercial sets. We're using the actual data that you're using for phones and mail. Um, second place we get our data, um, I go back to this, so we're also using some of the same third party data that Waldo's using. Um, all those logos that you saw, we're touching some of the same ones. But the fun part where we come in is that we're overlaying that commercial lifestyle demographic data with voter data. So frequently the request is for likely voting women who like to hike or, or whatever those things are. I actually have that going on right now. That's where we kind of uh, overlay different data sets and that's how the, the name campaign grid actually came about. So we'll take really taking those kinds of data, um, our data, third party data, and we're taking your data, meaning if, you, if you've got, built your own list um, through your campaign, we can, um, if the list is big enough, Pend a cookie to that, anonymize it, and then run ads uh, to that to that list specifically. The key part there is to an anonymize it, protect personal identifiable information, and that's where somewhere along the line, some uh, startup company will make the mistake of forgetting to do that step, and will get us in a lot of trouble. So we, we talk about that whenever we can. PII is very important, um, and then of course online data. Um, so in addition to some of these other places, um, basically 33 data set, 33 big data companies um, that provide this data. Um, where the, the ads go, we talked about this, it's um, the, the obvious places are display and video advertising. Um, we're moving more and more into mobile. Uh, mobile the, I think the inflection point probably was in the last year or two. Um, and you'll see, I think, a lot more video and mobile advertising. I saw one study that by 2017, display advertising will essentially, essentially be dead. Um, and that will be replaced with video, mobile, and um, in banner formats. Um, we're also seeing a little more kind of playing in the space where we're talking about all this data overlays and throwing it back into televisions, IP television. Um, we're playing in a couple of markets right now where you can essentially do all this fancy targeting back to your television. Um, social marketing, Facebook exchange, of course, was rolled out, in, was rolled out last fall. That's where we're taking uh, the voter file or any kind of third party data that we talked about through throwing it back into Facebook. So you can cookie target um, very uh, discrete third party data sets inside of Facebook. We've done a little bit of it. It, it you know, it, it's not uh, the end all be all. It's pretty cool, trust me. But it, it, you know, it hasn't necessarily displaced all the other things we already do. And of course, search advertising. Um, <clears throat> take all those things, throw them together. So, really, what we, what we have is two moving parts. One is lots and lots of data, one is lots and lots of inventory. Um, reaching essentially the same exchanges uh, and networks that Waldo's talking about. Um, this is something we already all, we all know, but this is kind of the conversation that I have every day. These lines that we're talking about here have no, bear no resemblance to any political jurisdiction or public affairs project. So what this is, is essentially, uh, these are DMA, this is a DMA map. This represents um, a decent sized radius from the, the antenna where the TV station is throwing out its analog signal. Um, so. What I do every day is explain to television and, and traditional media buyers why this is a terrible way to buy media. Um, so <clears throat> briefly, what we learned in 2012 was that look-alike modeling does not always um, equal act-alike modeling. It's especially prominent, um, prominent with um, fundraising and GOTV. 
So just because there's a very tiny, probably like 1% of Americans will donate to a political campaign, those individuals don't necessarily look too different than their neighbors who are never going to contribute. So trying to raise money online, it's really important to just go beyond lookalike modeling. Same thing when you're talking, talking about um, uh, looking for GOTV modeling. So particularly in 2013, when there's a lot of off-year municipal special elections, when we're trying to turn out a very specific set of people, if the last time they voted was 2009 and that represents 8, 10, 15 percent of the, of the, the city's population, it's crazy to look for lookalike modeling where we're not just never going to find, you know, citizens. So really important to think about that. Um, again, we're, we're um, what we do, target data-driven advertising or cookie-driven advertising, works best if it's a discrete select. If it's if it's likely voting women, likely voting men, uh, primary voters, people who uh, have a college education and went and and kids, things like that. If you really don't care and you just want to, you know, need to, um, you know, you, you really want to. Uh, run lots and lots of ads in a zip code. You can call Google. Um, you can call like, call Facebook. But the reality is that that's so inefficient, and <clears throat> those ads should be competing with billboards, not with data-driven online advertising. Um, we're finding a lot more mobile advertising, not necessarily with um, the the wealthy. So lots and lots of mobile ads, of course, in New York and San Francisco. But we're seeing um, faster adoption rates also in places like West Texas. People places where. You know, everyone there doesn't own a MacBook Pro or a MacBook Air, but they own an Android or an iPhone as their personal computer. So we're seeing a lot more um, consumption um, per capita in places that you might not expect. Um, premium sites, Hulu, uh, Pandora, Hulu, um, any site where that has a salesperson that is selling ads to that site has a problem. So on a daily basis, uh, people come to my office and say, you should buy ads on our website. Um, our CPM is cheaper. We are, our audience is, is relevant, and you know they're all registered voters. And, and the truth is, this poor salesperson is lying. It, it's model behavior. It's just like model behavior. So, without data-driven advertising, these sites are going to have a lot of trouble. They're going to make it up in large buys where the buyers couldn't care less about the actual people listening to seeing the ads. But the truth is that places like Pandora and Hulu don't allow data-driven advertising just yet. And every day we hope they do because it would, you know, we would, we would, where's the camera? We'd be sending you a lot of money. <laughs> um, a lot of pollsters we, we talk to um, pay <coughs> obviously a great deal of attention to our data exhaust and what the analytics are looking like, um, kind of hour by hour or minute by minute. And we're seeing, um, so real time analytics overtaking polling at some point. Um, and then last thing, true digital integration. So. I spent five years at uh, campaigns and elections, and the question always, every year, with the, um, kind of that space was, what uh, percentage of campaign will uh, campaign funds will be spent online? And the debate is ongoing whether it's one percent or five percent or ten percent, fifteen percent, sure, fifty percent. I'd love that. Um, but the reality is that even if there's a amount of money that is that that amount of money is growing every year, no doubt, everyone in this room agrees that that amount is growing every year. And we can argue whether that's five percent or fifteen percent, depending on how you crunch the numbers. But the tr the, the difference what's what we're seeing in 2012 and 2014 now is that people like us, all of us in this room, are sitting at at the big boys table, and we're not getting the we're not getting the scraps that the TV buyer felt like um, they couldn't do anything with. We're actually making decisions. So. A, we're getting more money, but more importantly, we're being part. We're part of the decision-making process, which means that the traditional media consulting agency doesn't see us as a threat or an annoyance, but actually important important part of the decision-making apparatus. So another place that's uh, uh, where you don't want to uh, encourage your children to go into <laughs> sales is television sales. Um, this is the first year, I guess, in American history that television ownership has declined. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room that does not have a t home telephone or cable television at home. This is this this is going to continue for basically um, it's going to plateau at best. And and the reality is that the only thing that's growing here is addressable online media. So if I overlaid pre-roll tar voter targeted or data-driven pre-roll on top of this, the lines would be complete opposite. Um, same thing with direct mail. Um, I like showing this because everyone already knows that the U.S. Postal Service is. It's basically going out of business. What we, what I, what I think is un misunderstood is the, the how quickly profits have disappeared for the U.S. Postal Service. What this means is the addressability factor. The, the great thing about direct mail is it's addressable. You can run at run mail to this house on this day, and that's great. You can't do that with television or radio. The problem is that the U.S. Postal Service is going out of business. Whether that means mail will only be delivered five days a week or three days a week, that actually is 
equally just as important as the fact that you don't know when it's actually going to be delivered, whether it's going to arrive after election day or before election day. So the predictability of when mail is arriving is just as important of, of the number of arrival day, days. This is all great news for, for Waldo and I and Jim back behind my screen somewhere. <laughs> so what we're seeing in 2013 is uh, better reporting, attribution <laughs> modeling, um, creating some of the feedback loops that, that Waldo was talking about, growth of real-time bidding. And when I say growth of real-time bidding, that's another way to say if you sell website ads on a website that employs you for a living, you're going to need to find a new job really soon. Um, Data-driven advertising. We, uh, Campaign Grid provides the voter data behind LinkedIn, behind Yahoo, uh, behind many others. Um, we're inside of Facebook, so you think you're seeing more and more of that. Okay. Uh, Pre-roll demand. We saw, I think, around August of last year, almost overnight, the the requests that we saw for uh, proposals and for buys really flipped over. Originally, it was almost all display with some other th things to experiment, and then overnight it became, give me as much video as you can. I was walking in here this morning, and I have a, a candidate that said, how much can I spend with you today? Uh, all, but only on video, and that's that's where we're seeing um, that that's kind of the the shift that I've seen. Um, let's see, uh, did cable day driven cable television that's going to be coming in 2013, 2014, 2015. Coordinated advertising we talked about actually being in the room when all these decisions are being made rather than just getting a check at the end of the day, um, and then uh, consensus on efficacy. So almost every day someone asks me what how many GRP point how many GRPs can I buy or how many impressions do I need and I don't think anyone in this room yet has the science background to tell you that 10 20 40 80 impressions are enough to win an election so I know how many impressions are needed to uh, for you to remember the ad I know how many uh, impressions I tell people but wh whether that's 10 20 or 40 it the science is not there yet um, <clears throat> it will be um, the two but two or three big challenges that we face right now one is counterfeit data so there are only a couple sources for voter data in this country. If you ask your provider where are you getting your voter data and they can't give you an answer that you know, understand, and have seen that data in real life, don't use their stuff. It's probably fake or worse yet, modeled. So just keep an eye on that if you're, you know, if you're, if you're trying to figure out where to buy. That's a very important question to ask your provider. Um, European um, cookie laws have basically ended what we do in Europe, um, which would be really a fun place to do a lot of business, Waldo, as you know. Um, canceled all my business trips out there. So basically, any of the things we're talking about today it, are illegal in, in Europe. It's, it's, it's taken a lot of fun out of the, out of the game. Um, I think I want to, we'll go to questions in uh, gym. So that's my phone or no, my Twitter handle and all that stuff. So. All right. All right, so Jim Walsh is up next. If he's still up. San Jose, California, and uh, we're you know, nearby Palo, uh, Palo Alto, California, where they invented the internet. Uh, and they've all decided that all of this is a terrible idea uh, and we should all pack it in. So uh, you guys like, might as well go home now. There's no reason to actually be here. Uh, obviously, that's not true because why we're actually invited today is because there is absolutely nothing happening in the digital advertising space that is having more effect on American politics right now than uh, cookie based and audience-based targeting. Um, this past cycle, my firm, DS Political, uh, home of the political cookie, uh, worked with over uh, 200 different campaigns 
uh, to massive effect. We actually worked on about uh, 10 different U.S. Senate campaigns. We only lost one. Uh, we worked on about 40 different congressional races. I will quote you our record there. Uh, um, we, uh, we, we did a bunch of work with pretty much every single major super PAC uh, and pretty much every single union that did any kind of online anything. Uh, now, the, the interesting thing here is that we're only a two-year-old company. The question is, why did they actually decide to work with us? Well, uh, the reality is, folks like Jordan and folks like Brock are actually with the Republicans, and it's scared the Jesus out of Democrats. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we have to create a button, if you will, for the left that enable uh, Democratic campaigns specifically and progressive organizations, nonprofits, unions, uh, to be able to have better tools than even they were providing to the right. So I think you know the, the key for us was you know learning you know exactly how well these guys have built this stuff. And at the end of the day, like you know, uh, Democrats have always kind of I would say the last ten years have maintained a pretty amazing um, edge on in the technology space. Start, starting with Howard Dean's amazing fundraising, uh, the first time he ever raised a million dollars uh, online. Uh, well, that actually changed. Uh, there's a history here, and and, uh, and then Jordan actually should go into more detail about this because it's pretty amazing what they were able to do. Um, in 2010, there were over 150 different campaigns that were that were using uh, voter file targeted advertising. Same sorts of these guys were talking about. Unfortunately, none of them were Democrats, as far as I know. Maybe Jordan, you guys have one too. But but I, I'll tell you that the adoption among the Republican Party was actually kind of incredible. Um, and so, and I give campaign for the actually amazing credit for this. Uh, well, all right, but what's interesting about that, right? So number one, there's no reporting requirements uh, for campaigns to, to really release exactly uh, on a daily basis, you know, what more weekly basis or monthly basis, what their internet spend is like it is on TV. It, it, everybody raised their hand who's never worked on a political campaign before. I can sort of see you. If you've worked on a political campaign? People raise their hands. No one? Jesus, really? Okay. No, 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 a bunch of people. Is that one person? All right, very fast. Awesome. Bunch so of people raised their person, uh, at some point, if they were an intern on campaign, they were <laughs> asked to actually drive out to a TV station, um, uh, this is their, your, your first out of college job, and actually pick up every single media buy from the opposing campaign at the local TV station. Well, you can't do that with the internet. As Jordan said, a lot of us actually work through consulting firms, and so we never even show up on FBC uh, reports. So as a result, um, uh, the campaigns that work, uh, you know, with Campaign Grid, Rocket Fuel, and others, um, that actually do this kind of targeting, at the end of the day, uh, your Democratic campaign, your union, your nonprofit isn't going to have any idea what's actually running on the internet because you're targeting individual people. So Jordan's actually trying to go after independents, um, you know, and Waldo's going after, you know, hard Republicans. Uh, you know, that means that the entire field has been opened up uh, in a way that where Democrats are not even competing. So anyway, so these political uh, saw the reality on the ground uh, in the 20th cycle and decided that it was time for Democrats to be able to play, play in the, the same game. Uh, we uh, went to the absolute best data source we possibly could on the left, uh, Catalyst. Uh, Ricky Bell is actually the fact, Ricky, you wave your hand real quick. There it is. Um, Long story short, Catalyst uh, as a trust was built in mid 2000s as a way of making sure that uh, the Republican uh, voter vaults, uh, which many of you may be familiar with, uh, the database of voters held at RNC, uh, at least had a, uh, a mirror on the on their Democratic side, if not a better uh, uh, set of data. Uh, well, they they achieved that quite significantly over the course of the, of the last six or seven years. They've been able to not only gather immense amounts of data specific to voting behavior, uh, who's a registered voter, who's not a registered voter, but also combine that with, with consumer files that allow us to actually have a ton of information about individual uh, uh, potential voters out there. And up to now, most of that data has actually been used by direct mail vendors. It's been used by uh, you know uh, pollsters. It's been by you know phone firms, by TV firms that are doing. Uh, trying to with like uh, what the universe is you're, you're trying to go after. Well, uh, we approached them and said that it was about time for online advertising, uh, uh, at least on the left, to actually come to maturity. And so we partnered with Catalyst to match a 600 million uh, cookie bit uh, pool with a, uh, the, I think Catalyst has around 280 million records. Um, 
It took us a couple of us to actually come up with a match, but once we did it, we were able to break it into 42 different targetable segments. Now, when I say that, I mean that you now have the ability of actually targeting your online advertising just like you would your direct mail. Uh, now, again, all of you have heard these two guys kind of drone on the last uh, hour or so about all of the different advertising networks that they connect to, all the various different you know artificial intelligence that they're doing to actually make sure that we're reaching those individual people. I won't go into too much of that because we did the exact same stuff. What I will say, though, is that, and Jordan made a very important point a second ago, um, data. The core of your data is the most important part of this kind of this kind of targeting. At the end of the day, making sure that you have the ability of knowing that you know your ad campaign is actually targeting real Democrats or real independents or real Republicans or people that are actually females or actually 18 to 35 or what whatever your demographic range is, whatever whatever your parameters are, are actually ideal. So we started there, um, and so we once we did the match with Catalyst, we made sure that that they certified every single bit of what we were doing along the way to make sure that the data was there. Um, now, those of you that are uh, that work on you know, nonprofits and the you know, corporate uh, space and the left, I uh, know that there are a bunch of different organizations that entire, their entire job is to make sure that every all the different tactics that Democrats are doing are, are, are tested. Uh, there's groups like the Analyst Institute that are out there that you know try different ways. You know, what are the best methodologies for you know doing a full door knock? What are the best methodologies for uh, you know calling a, a specific a direct mail universe? Um, well, at the end of the day, we knew we were going to have a much higher bar uh, to meet than almost any other of the, uh, these guys are actually going to have to on the right, because there are all these institutions on the left that. You know, are suspicious of new, of new strategies, not because they, you know, that's a bad thing, but because they want to make sure that if we're going to do something, we're doing it the best possible way. So we were truly put in the ringer this past cycle. We, we again, as I said, work with about 200 organizations. Let's start it out with uh, a number of the really large union society to actually take a chance on us and, tr and, tr and try out the technology. Uh, one of my favorite case studies of this past cycle was we worked with uh, uh, the USCW, the United Union of Commercial Workers. Now, as Jordan mentioned, one thing that we have as a ability is, is being able to uh, create a custom audience. Well, remember, union members are a very specific audience. And many times they're actually not even able to be reached on the internet very easily because they're you know, actually sitting in front of a, a desktop all day. So it was a really complicated <laughs> issue. And we had to figure out how we could actually both maximize uh, the match, meaning that, that we knew who the members were, the specific union members, uh, found, them on the, found them on the internet, and then we're able to serve them as enough volume to actually have a measurable effect and drive into the polls in November. Um, and then on top of that, be able to do some intelligent modeling within partnership with Catalyst to find clusters of, of individual union members or at least supporters of unions that were that would uh, that would be interested in the same kind of message that we were planning on running as our ad campaign. Well, we ran the campaign across uh, 14 different states. Uh, it, you know, we had pre-roll video, in-banner video, uh, rich media banner ads, uh, takeovers on pages. Um, we actually had a 60% match rate with the UFCW member file. Now, those of you that uh, have been listening to this for the last hour, I hope you understand what that means. Because again, if, if you have a one-to-one -one match with the universe, and it's a 60% match, that means that 60% of your core file you're able to actually target. That's amazing. That, that's something that hasn't been able to be done since direct mail. Um, and so again, forget about modeling for a second. Simply the one-to-one -one match, cookie-based targeting allows you to do that sort of thing. And now, in, and with this particular campaign, we were able to pair it with a mobile bot. Uh, so we were able to do the same sort of thing with mobile that we we're able to do online, even though it wasn't put based on third-party cookies. Um, as I think Waldo said, uh, and I love this phrase, cookies can crumble, because at the end of the day, as, as, as Jordan also mentioned, this has been outlawed in Europe. So what we think, so what we did was we made sure that you know, it wasn't just the, the browser-based cookie that we were targeting against, it was also the, the mobile device. Um, at the end of the day, we were able to drive uh, support for Barack Obama from someone that in the neighborhood of 40s, believe it or not, up to around 70%. Uh, we were able to drive a uh, majority of the people actually to the polls on election day as well, through a number of GOTV ads we were running. And there was a measurable effect. Um, and so, you know, again, on the left, we walked in the door, you know, realizing that there was really no other option for Democrats when they wanted to do this kind of advertising. Uh, we had to build it better. We had to build it bigger, um, and uh, we think we did that. Uh, our partnership with Callus was key.
being able to make sure that our data was real, make sure that modeling was actually certified by folks that actually understood campaigns, not came from the, the corporate space. And uh, at the end of the day, the 200 campaigns that worked with us uh, had an amazing effect on this year's election. I think that in going into, you know, looking forward, we're in 2014, there are 37 governor races up. Uh, Jordan, I, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think there are 27 cent races, is that right? I have no idea, Jim. <laughs> Sounds about it's, right. It's somewhere 30. Yeah, it's right. So, so, so there, there, there's going to be a ton of <laughs> on the ground internet battle going on on these exchanges, on these ad exchanges. Um, you know, people are going to be bidding on similar cookies. It's going to be crazy. Uh, so three of our firms are definitely, you, you, whether you like it or not, you're going to be seeing the three of our firms actually serving you ads. And everybody that you know in every single state where there's going to be a, a governor's race or a Senate race, they're going to be ad served. So I think Alan was really intelligent to actually put this, this round table together with these guys on it because uh, this is where the major battleground is going to be. If, there's, if there is a quote unquote cyberspace war, and I hate that term, but if there is a cyberspace war going on, it's happening between these, these three firms. Um, and I think, you know, uh, I, 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 won't, I, won't, I, I didn't actually decide to put together a PowerPoint presentation after I realized that uh, Walden would put together it's such an amazing piece. But, uh, so I, I don't want to drone on too much, I really do want to get questions. But um, I, I will say this is an incredibly important issue. Um, you, know, you know, our firm's able to reach 90% of the U.S. Internet. We're able to, because of our data, able to match at a higher rate than any firm that I'm familiar with. And we're able to target with granularity both on top now and on mobile devices. Um, so I think that you know, going next year, the battleground will certainly be on the desktop. I think the the, the real victory will come in of who figures out mobile the best. Uh, we're certainly giving our, our best shot. Uh, but you know, I, I'll kind of stop there and, and open up the questions. But again, like I think I think this is if there's one internet roundtable to actually pay attention to uh, regarding next year's election cycle, especially the internet portion, this is the one to be in. Well, th thank you, Jim. Um, so basically what we're hearing is uh, artificial intelligence to use uh, uh, to target uh, ads. We're hearing data uh, collected from voter files and from cookies and from external sources in order to bring a level of targeting to uh, online advertising that um, we are comfortable or familiar with in seeing in direct mail. Uh, and these are major innovations in really trying to take that um, that the, the online space to a whole new level. I have some questions, but um, are there questions from the audience? We'll start with that. Peter. Yeah, um, both uh, Jim and Jordan brought up the idea that um, some of the data that's being peddled maybe is suspect. And what is it that consumers or clients mm -hmm. should look for to make sure that their data is not, I mean, you guys both worry yeah. about it, so I think it's important. That's a good question, Peter. Um, <clears throat> Data needs to come from a real live source, whether it's Jim's uh, Catalyst data, which is fantastic. Um, we use other data, nonpartisan, typically nonpartisan data. Um, it's the same data that when you call and say, I need to deliver a bunch of robocalls or piece of mail, it comes from the same source. If you're calling a, if your source says, oh, it's uh, commercially, uh, modeled likely voters, you should run for the hills. If they don't want to give you a name of the original source data, you should not use it. I agree. <clears throat> I, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, they're, they're, it's amazing to me. And again, you know, I, I come from campaigns, guys. I, I uh, you know, <laughs> reason this, I was working, I was actually working on the ground. I was either doing communications or I was working on the internet team of you know campaigns and in my previous life I was at the Salsa Labs doing you know class deal email and CRM. So I, I understand like you know good data versus bad data. And when we entered this space, it was just amazing to us what folks were out there in the market selling. Um, uh, it, it is just a fact that unless you have a core database that is trusted, has been tested in other ways, including direct mail, you really you, you're really relying on frankly hocus focus. So I'm going to ask, uh, I've got a question. We've talked a lot about uh, targeting and how increasingly you're able to target the ads directly at the people that you're trying to reach. Democrats if you're running a Democratic campaign, Republicans if you're trying to re run a Republican campaign, independents, etc. cetera. Uh, and what it's, one thing that sort of strikes me is that if you're targeting, well, it's two sides. If you're targeting just those people, it seems that you're leaving inventory open for the other side to be able to target 
their side much more much more um, much more access to be able to do that. Whereas if you were doing the old style where you were over targeting and reaching, you were actually sucking up inventory that might have been useful to your opponent. Uh, is there a trade-off in terms of only reaching the people that you want and maybe the money that you save versus uh, and leaving open the ability to reach the people that, through inventory that yeah. you might have denied the other side before? Let me, let me answer that, um, Alan. I reject the <clears throat> premise of your question. All right. <laughs> <laughs> here, here, it, it, the question is, if you're only running ads to likely voters, I don't care what party, but if you're only running ads to likely voters, what's the value in running ads to non-likely voters or people that don't matter? No, no I don't mean non-likely, but if you're only r running the ads to likely Democrats, yeah. You're not uh, buying ads that would be served to likely Republicans. Oh, no, no. So, okay. So, the question is, the question is a targeting strategy question. Oh, and, and so, no, you, there was no reason. I, I promise you, Jim runs lots of ads to Republicans. Uh, Jim runs ads to swing voting Republicans who don't vote in primaries. Um, if I'm working on a Republican campaign, I do lots of ads to soft Democrats. That's, there's no doubt about that. The question is, you know, Democrats run ads to Republicans, and everyone runs ads to, to independents. So this allows you to put the right ads yeah. to the right people. Yeah, there's no, yeah, there's no, there's no ways. Okay. Uh, I, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, one one of the things I usually quote when, when I'm talking to a campaign, and they're trying to figure out like what the correct medium is here. And, and I mean, Jordan will, will will say this probably too. I would assume, you know, a lot of the work that we do is kind of helping campaigns just be more efficient with their media. Um, at the end of the day, like you know, if you're if you're a TV buyer. And you're looking at you know the New Jersey uh, you know Senate race coming up. Uh, chances are, like you're gonna you're, you're gonna make some pretty tough choices with your spend because at the end of the day, those DMAs are incredibly expensive media markets by TV. And so you know when they come to a DS political, they say, okay, I know I can run pre-roll video with you. I know I can force it in front of whoever I'm actually whoever's, whoever's gonna watch their video. With you, I have the ability of being able to target exactly the voters I want. And so, you know, their alternative, if they want to use the internet, is to do, go to Google, do a DMA-based buy or a zip code-based buy, and right? hit everybody in the area. Well, out of that $100 they spend on that Google buy, maybe $5 hits the target we're going after in the first place, and certainly not the repetition that's necessary for, for true uh, persuasion uh, online. Now, if they come to a DS political, they're able to target, before they even begin their campaign, every single dollar they spend of that $100 at exactly the target that their pollsters have actually told them they should go after. And they can coordinate that attack both with whatever TV buys they do do, they can coordinate that with the direct mail buys they do, and they can coordinate with the, the door knocks and with the, the, the phone calling they're going to be doing. So this is so, a real... You know, it, it's, it's about actually saving these campaigns money while also making them more effective. And then the repetition that we get, and this is something I think that is, is missed a lot of times when we're talking about this form of advertising. Because we are using basically what was a marketing, considered a marketing technology previously where we could you know, serve an ad to an individual that came to our website, except we've gathered all the cookies and we serve them ads based on our, our target profile. We can serve up to 50 to 60 times per month a banner ad to an individual voter. Now think about that. You can actually get your, your, your your banner ad in front of an individual person over 40 to 60 times a month, depending on your, your reach in the campaign and the bids and everything else. But I mean, if you're driving to the beach and along the way you see a sign for a store every five feet for a hundred miles, and the person sitting in the passenger seat next to you sees the exact sign, except it's a totally different ad specifically customized to them. I can pretty much guarantee you that by the time you get to, you know, impression number 60, you're, you're thinking it might be an interesting idea to go check out that store. And that's that's kind of the goal here is that repetition, I mean, back, back in the day when I worked in campaign, folks used to say, um, uh, you know, repetition equals turnout. You know, the number of times you can actually reach someone's door, reach them by phone, reach them with direct mail, reach them with a TV impression. Now we're able to quadruple that, that those impressions online and for an incredibly inexpensive price by comparison. So, and even more efficiently than the Google can. Um, I'll echo a few sentiments here, but in what, what Jim just said, um, repeti uh, repetition equals turnout. <coughs> repetition can also equal burnout. And I think this is one of the things that we are trying to drive home with. You know, at the end of the day, it's, it's all about spending your media dollars uh, wisely, more efficiently, targeting exactly the audience that you're looking to hit at key moments of influence because, you know, sort of, the, again, the old ways of doing things is, I, I refer to it as 
carpet bombing. Anybody who's old enough to remember what carpet bombing really meant um, understands that it's just dropping gross tonnage on the same people, the same eyeballs, ad nauseum. I think the more impactful approach, and, and certainly what we're seeing from a lot of different campaigns across the spectrum, not just political and advocacy campaigns, is the best time to reach people is when they're most likely to take an action consistent with whatever your objective is. It isn't just simply dropping the same ad on different platforms 500 times until the person you know, wants to rip their hair out. And I think that's really where uh, the difference in the technology is at this point. If you know that you can reach that person, because uh, again, the objectives are gonna differ. If it's, if it's a campaign that's looking to drive fundraising versus one that's, that's simply awareness, or get out the vote, I mean, they're going to have different objectives. They're going to have different metrics that, that are, are going to be judged successful. And that's the sort of thing that, again, technology sort of purpose built to focus on, uh, you know, a campaign objective like that that can automatically optimize to drive more of those results is, is going to give you better results. I think Waldo's comment about the right ad at the right time is a, is a great one. And to take Jim's analogy of the billboard on the way to the beach, imagine if the same ad was on the front and the back of that billboard. So that as you're driving to the beach with the store in front of you, you see the ads all the time and then you go to the store. But as you're driving home with the store behind you, you're still seeing the same ad to go to the store that's no longer in front of you. I think uh, the idea is that repetition is great if it's at the right time and you know at the right location in order to yeah, make sure yeah, that I, you get I, the I don't, want to be, I don't want to be mischaracterized here. So, so, so that, the, the, the repetition is one aspect of this, right? So that, that's step one. Step two is making sure that, that you have a chain of engagement, just like you would with a, an email campaign, right? right? So one thing that we have the ability of doing is making sure that after impression number 10, you see a different creative. After impression number 20, you see a different creative thing, which means that you can turn up the volume or turn down the volume on a particular ads on an individual targeted basis per individual person who's seen your ad a certain number of times. I mean, if you're talking, I mean, if we're talking, you know, eight years ago, I mean, we would have been talking the same, doing the same thing with, with last email, except, you know, that's, we've already been that. This is, this is the new frontier of being able to have individual engagements, individual conversations with folks. And finally, I would say that, you know, to your point about, you know, looking in your rear view mirror and see, or you're driving back and seeing the same sign, actually you don't see the same sign, not only because we can actually change up the amount of engagement that someone has on an individual impression-based basis on the volume they sting the ad, but we can also make sure that we remarket them after they've actually clicked on an ad itself. So let's say, for instance, after the 10th time, an individual voter has actually been like, all right, I'm going to take a look at this campaign page. We can make sure there's a cookie waiting for them on that, that site that then puts them in an entirely different category and allows us to actually serve an entirely different set of ads um, you know, based on the action they're taking. Again, though, I mean, if someone refuses to click on an ad after 60 times, uh, you got a problem. But if you have the ability of actually driving them on you know, time 30, time 40, time 50, uh, and then put them in a separate pool once they've actually clicked on it, that's when you get down to really granular individual message-based uh, advertising. Any other more questions? I don't know if this is <clears throat> totally in context, but could you explain to me the difference between, I think, you were talking more of this cookie based data process, and is Robert Peel you're talking about uh, with, um, artificial intelligence? Artificial is intelligence, there difference, right. Is there a difference, and could you explain to me what the difference is? Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, start. Um, artificial intelligence, where it relates to the rocket fuel platform, is um, on, on rocket fuel. The artificial intelligence isn't isn't um, the sum total of what we're doing. The AI system helps to manage, helps to draw uh, conclusions between non-intuitive data as well as the intuitive data. It helps us to sort of understand signals in the process of evaluating campaigns sort of as they happen in real time so we can figure out where is the most responsive audience and sort of what are the commonalities and what are the differences there and so it helps us to do act-alike modeling, look-alike modeling. It's also helping us to continuously uh, optimize to what those campaign objectives are. So the objective again is going to be different. It could be um, you know, striking a, a certain uh, uh, ECPA. It could be based on click-through. It could be on completed ver uh, video views. It could be on donations generated. 
that's what we set into our AI system to actually help do our, our campaign optimization on an ongoing basis. But from the standpoint of the targeting that we're doing, we do cookie targeting, but we also do data-driven targeting. So we have the ability to seamlessly shift depending upon the needs of the campaign and depending upon you know the, the sort of the hopes and the aspirations of the advertiser, what they're looking to accomplish. So we don't rely solely on cookie-based targeting. It is a part of our, our proposition and our platform, but we have the ability to go to literally thousands of different data models and audience models to actually do the data-driven targeting. So the AI is separate. The AI, again, is what helps us pull all this information in to make sense of, of really what's happening in the environment. So at the end of the day, when an advertiser says, well, I know I just delivered 10 million impressions and I got X number of click-throughs, who are these people? We actually can give that information back to them in very, very rich detail and, and tell them a level of, of granularity about exactly who this responsive audience is that oftentimes they've just never been privy to before. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll be quick. The, um the, don't get too caught up on the language. The AI is um, a, a buying platform that optimizes, and there's data. I think if you if you had to differentiate us, I think it would be on the po political and public affairs focus um, versus um, lots and lots of you know international corporate. You know, I don't know about Rocket Fuel, but I think that's that's probably a bigger difference. So yeah. you so you're saying that that at least with respect to elections, the ability to hone in on, on registered voters, likely voters, as opposed to the marketplace of potential customers, uh, slightly different, uh, although I would imagine you, you, you used voter da data files as well. We, we are not currently using the national voter data file. That's not to say that we are not going to add that. I'm not going to get into sort of future plans, but um, uh, again, just going back to the data sources that we pull from 35 data partners. Of the 35 that we currently are working with, we've got 16 that are providing us with rich, I mean on a spreadsheet it, it's 800 lines worth of, of uh, variations of political information about who these people are. Likely voters, known voters, heads of households or Republicans, um, you know, interests. I, I mean the, the list goes on and on and we don't have time to really yeah, get I into mean, that. I, but that's I, that's I the sort of stuff that... I'm sorry, I didn't want to a wall there. But I, I do want to say something here that's really important, and this, this is very specific to this space. Um, it's a specific space. It's a very unique space. Politics is different than corporations. Selling a selling a, a candidate or selling a an idea if you're a nonprofit or trying to convince somebody to convert into a donor or convert into you know whatever you need in this space is a different fundamental ask than asking someone to buy you know your product. Um, and even though the, 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 some of the technologies are the same and some of the methodologies are the same, um, I challenge you to find a single direct mail vendor who actually relies on you know millions of algorithms to actually find their target universe. What they do is they actually go to data warehouses whose job this is to make sure they find individual voters and they actually go after, they go after individual, um, and they find that individual person and they mail them a piece of direct mail. Same with phone vendors. Um, and I really, I, you know, I bristle a little bit at the idea that the internet should be treated as some sort of mystical black box um, that, you know, we can just find these people magically through their cover. I think that at the end of the day, the technology is available right now for us to do individual level based targeting, both on mobile devices and on cookie based targeting. Um, and even though I think that modeling is a good thing, it needs to be based on that core universe that you've already identified as real people. Otherwise, you know, I mean, Maybe what works for, you know, what, what Ford will buy is like excellent and will help them, you know, sell a couple more uh, trucks. At the end of the day, um, a, a registered voter is a registered voter. They are not, you know, they're not a consumer. They're, that is a one or a zero. And so I think that being able to differentiate this space with the corporate space is critical to understanding, you know, why people would work with campaign grid and be as political somehow. So, Jim, I'm going to push a little bit back on that. I think what you're saying is absolutely true for uh, political elections, for elections, when voters matter. But when we get into advocacy, mm -hmm. uh, non-registered non voters but still citizens, uh, if they're not registered or even if they're not likely to vote, can still have a great deal of impact on the legislative process. Uh, and, oh, no, no. And, so, and so I think it's important to have a hybrid here. Even in that regard, though, Alan, I think that making sure that those people are still identified as real 
individual people on the internet rather than you know some yes. some mythical unicorn who might be a, a heavy activist. <laughs> I think it's really critical. You have to understand the data points that lead to who, you know, what an activist looks like, and you know if, if you can come up with that for the offline universe, um, that will apply to the online universe. You just have to do the first part. If I if I could add. Um... If you're an activist, you're probably registered to vote. Probably, but there are some. There, there is a handful of activists who yeah. are either not quite old enough to vote yet, but very, but True. maybe yeah. down the, you know, by the I time agree. the next election rolls around, who are, uh, who choose not to register and vote because they think that voting is a waste of time mm -hmm. and that activism on, a, on an advocacy level is is more effective. There are some yeah. exceptions, but they're not that many, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I also want to make the point that that, um, you know. Again, one of the things that uh, that we're uh, trying actively to do is is to unravel some of the mystique that has been basically built into this industry over the years. You know, networks have, have frankly, in some cases, done a horrible disservice to this business. They've they've uh, put some advertisers in a pretty awkward position. So one of the things that Rocket Fuel is looking to do is to is to completely demystify and and be completely transparent in how this works, and we will share. Both the data modeling, we will, you know, work hand in glove with with uh, clients and actually setting up the parameters of how they're targeting. But the thing, the point that I, I really want to drive home is that technology, when you get right down to it, is agnostic. I mean, we can talk all day and try to convince you that politics is different and that at the end of the day, you know, only the only the only thing that's going to work is having access to the national voter data file. The truth of the matter is, we've seen it not hundreds of times; we've seen it thousands of times across campaigns that span from the advocacy to the political to the corporate to the nonprofit and everything in between and when you're talking about having an objective whether that objective is fundraising for for a, for a political candidate or fundraising for a charity or for an advocacy group technology is agnostic if you know what the objective is and if you can if you can pull the data together if you can model it you can find those people and if you've got the ability to optimize automatically at the end of the day the results are what matter and that's the sort of thing that we always point you know our our, our advertisers to and say you know is is are we are we driving the results for you and so that's again where we're trying to take this to demystify the process and Great. make it a lot less peter uh, alan can I, can I ask you a question is, is there a way we get a survey of the, of the room like, like how many folks are, are actually work for nonprofits? how many of you work for nonprofits? cool about half and and, and how many of you actually uh, are engaged in like electoral aspects of you know with your nonprofit? You know, where you actually involve yourself in campaigns or in an election? Just just one or two. Okay, and and so and so I, I'm just curious. You know, I mean, like there are applications of this stuff that I want to make sure that we do get to. Where the crowd that was nice enough to show up? Um, and again, I apologize not being there. I'm at the uh, Networks Nation conference, um, but. Uh, but I want to make sure that we, we make this apply because I think Alan, to your point before, you know, I don't want to just talk about the political aspects of this stuff because, like, we were we did a ton of work with nonprofits last year. I'm sure these guys did too. Um, so, you know, I, I want to open up the floor to, to, to specific questions about you know applications within the advocacy space. Peter, I, I just want to add. Sorry, Jim. I just want to add to what you just said. Um, you, you said I agree with you that we need to be talking to real voters. Absolutely. But isn't there stuff, I mean, there's a big article in the New York Times Sunday, Jordan, I'm sure you saw it, and we, and now we saw it, about how selling pizza is like selling the president, and there's all this hype about, maybe it's hype, maybe it's not hype, about how Obama's data people are now getting commercial contracts and stuff. So, so is what you're, I mean, isn't, aren't there signals and information that's available, maybe online, maybe offline, that you know traditional direct mailers, mailers haven't used? That is perhaps predictive of something else. So, for, so it's just, just no, no, I, so, I, I, so something I, I like the gun so. issues. I, mean, the, the, I think the reason why you're seeing Obama's data team being hired and going corporate is because a lot of corporate people will do it badly. Um, I mean, one thing that you actually saw in on Barack Obama's campaign was an amazing. I mean, for the budgets they were dealing with, even though I mean, we think of Barack Obama's campaign as having you know, so much money, at the end of the day, like I don't care what campaign you're on, you don't really get that much money when you're building your team, especially a data team that usually is, is sidelined. Barack Obama's team, honestly, was one of the few teams that actually did get sidelined, but they but but they, they just did it better. They, they used the best practices that came out of places like the Analyst Institute that I mentioned before, 
um, that came out, you know, campaigns for a number of years, you know, very good statistical analysis, and we're given the support to actually test out things um, right. here so, and there. And I think the reason why they are going corporate is because, you know, the traditional stuff that you saw, you know, the Romney team, frankly, actually like employed, wasn't that good. Um, and so, you know, you know, it is a credit to the Obama team that they are able to, you know, make that jump from politics into the to private sphere. But I think it's because of their quality versus what's typically out in the corporate space. And again, that's why I think that politics and even the advocacy space is a is an amazing incubator of uh, best practices that eventually make it in the private space. And I see. I think that is a perfect example of it. And I agree with that. But what I'm asking really is, isn't there data that might not be contained necessarily in the voter file or even in what we traditionally use that might be informative? Um, oh, absolutely. So, yeah, so they can use that stuff too. So I mean, I, I, I would be hypocrite if I didn't admit that. OK. Any other, any other questions? Uh, any final wrap-up comments? Oh, we're started. That was a, um, a lively discussion. I've, I've done a lot of panels where there's, um, it's just a pitch. Yeah. And you know, this is refreshing. I think it's really important, and I'm, we still have, we still have about 20 minutes left. So, if uh, if we can, if I can take a couple minutes, I think it's really important to think about online advertising within within the larger context. And I think uh, Jim uh, mentioned this earlier in terms of you know you've got your ads being targeted, uh, then you have your direct mail being targeted, then you have door knocks uh, going out. Uh, you may have um, you may have uh, events if you're an advocacy organization. You may be doing offline or social media. And I think uh, the, the 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 truth of the matter is is that we need to think of these within the larger context. You know, we've been talking about online ad targeting here, but an online ad that's targeted to the right audience uh, is is a rather impersonal, even though it's well targeted. It's a very discreet hit, uh, and then but if it's combined with a, a, a PR campaign that's getting your issue into the news, a social media campaign that's building up conversation about it, door knocking in a political campaign where somebody comes to the door and follows up on the information you're getting to your ads. Uh, what we find is that the combination of these multi-channels increases dramatically the effectiveness of your campaign. Um, just the diversion of TV ad budgets to online ad budgets. The, the data shows that something along the order of a 20% diversion of your TV ad budget to online ads will double the effectiveness of your ad campaign overall. Uh, uh, cable news is talking, uh, cable net networks are talking about an 18% diversion, or rather a 20% diversion mm -hmm. of your uh, cable news, cable network uh, on uh, TV ads to their uh, corresponding websites would increase uh, your effectiveness of those ads by 80%. I mean, these are the kind of numbers that we're seeing here. So when you think in terms of these targeted online ads, uh, online campaigns, ad campaigns, don't think of them in isolation. Think of them as part of the larger, the larger campaign. Think about reinforcing the messages. Think about the timing of the messages. Uh, we did some messages. Um, uh, who, who's here from the American Cancer S Society? Uh, so um, I, I did some work with the American Cancer Society back, um, uh, we did a, a week long with, um, it was originally with Fran Drescher. Uh, she pulled out halfway through the week. But, uh, um, but we were doing things where we would, um, we would do uh, mobilize people uh, with emails, with online ads, uh, with direct outreach, uh, we would uh, target the uh, uh, po lawmakers one day with faxes, one day with emails, one day with phone calls. Uh, and, and the idea was to get multiple channels going out and multiple channels going in in order to increase the traction of the messaging, increase the likelihood that they'll remember it, increase the likelihood that it'll influence the outcome. And I think uh, this is a lesson that we want to take across the board. And, uh, and these innovations here are really uh, sort of one part of that larger equation. Yes, George? I was a little late, so we may have already talked about this, but um, the decision of Firefox to uh, start to control cookies uh, is, a, is going to be interesting in terms of how it affects some people in advertising. Um, yeah, too soon to tell. I just saw I just saw uh, some of that information um, earlier today and forwarded it on to a friend, just sort of watching it. Uh, but again, I think that sort of underscores uh, the importance of why you don't want to rely specifically on cookies and, and cookies alone. I mean, you, you know, that's why that's why the whole notion of data-driven targeting as 
as sort of the umbrella under which cookie targeting uh, falls means that even if that happens, we've got, we've got you know, 1.8 billion profiles of internet users out there that we can find, whether it's on a lookalike or on an act-alike basis, predicated upon all the data out there. So it doesn't have to be, and we do, we do this sort of retargeting, intelligent retargeting all, all day long, where it means little if, I mean, it doesn't mean, we, we don't have to have had, a, you know, somebody actually go to a website to retarget them. Um, so anyway, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a source of concern, but, but it's, it's, it doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, mean the death knell for, for this business. I think a lot of websites depend on cookies, and, you know, Firefox may lead to the situation where people are trying to restrict cookies, and they'll discover that their Internet experience is significantly undermined, not just with regard to ads, but with regard to just uh, website experiences, and uh, um, you may find a lot of people simply not using it. Or realizing that it wasn't as the trade-off wasn't wasn't worth it. No. I was going to say one other thing. I mean, you know, whether whether digital is the primary driver for a campaign or for an organization, or whether it's secondary and supplemental to a bigger initiative, the key really is, as Alan said, all about um, integration with the broader efforts and, and again I know there are other companies that are doing this but this is the sort of this is this is essentially what we sort of preach is you know don't get too pigeonholed into thinking you know it's all about the display or it's all about the video or a single channel and that's why we put campaigns together that run on all four mediums and we automatically optimize so the budgets are flexible so when we see that we're getting extraordinary performance on mobile video we literally can in real time start to you know, move all of our telemetry towards going after that audience. And, and when you can make that sort of change on the fly and you know that you're out there and you're reaching the same people, um, and again, it's at the end of the day, you're, you're looking to, you're going to see just better results uh, in general. And, and, and again, targeting is one thing, but what you say to each targeted audience is really the bottom line. Jim, I, I love the way you framed this um, in a meeting we had uh, a while back. Uh, where it used to be sort of like the Don Draper in the room saying, this is the campaign, and you have to go for this because we're creative, and we came up with this brilliant campaign, and don't you love it? Whereas um, I think these days you go in and you say, well, we have a, a half dozen ideas of what the messages should be to the different audiences, uh, but before we commit large amounts of money to any one of them, we're going to set up a grid, we're going to set up all, all the different messages, we're going to try the messages out on all the different demographic and target groups, and see which target groups respond to which messages more effectively, and then we'll optimize the campaign based on that. And then I think what I'm hearing uh, from Waldo and, and in general across the board with all the data-driven stuff is that once you've done that up front, then as the campaign moves forward, you can continue to revise as the ads wane in their effectiveness or some surge in their effectiveness in order to shift in real time after you've launched the campaign as well. And I think these are really some of the key key issues and what it, what it really focuses on is it's not just about the targeting, it's not just about the ability to monitor which is working, which is not, it's about which message goes to which group and using the one that's most effective and being flexible enough to adjust on, on the fly as you develop. And, and uh, one thing worth noting here is that um, the technology has is, is progressed to the point where we don't actually have to uh, do do sort of the, the A-B testing in the way that it's been done in the past. When you're doing this stuff in real time, we launch campaigns all the time where we literally launch the campaign and in real time are evaluating the efficacy of each different piece of creative and as you know, they start to show signals and show results, they are automatically cut off. They don't even need to have sort of human involvement there. But more importantly, again, because everything that we do is done in real time, we're doing a lot of real-time brand optimization, real-time advocacy awareness, where our, our performance, our ability to go out and find the audience, buy the ads, deliver the ads, and then continue to drive the results are dictated by this dynamic creative capability where we literally can put together thousands of permutations of an ad and we can see in a, in a split second uh, exactly who this person is and serve you know, an ad with, with different colors, a different message, different creative, to you know, two people sitting right next to each other look totally different, um, and we can do that all day long for you know for thousands of different campaigns. And again, that's and that's going on across 
multiple screens. It's doing, doing something different in display, something different in video, something different in the mobile space, and then social, of course, with uh, with FBX. Uh, that's that's um, I mean, it's kind of a built-in capability. I, I want to hear, like, hear Jordan's opinion, but I've got something I want to add on to that. Go ahead, Jordan. I actually want to go back to the great opportunity that we all have in this room for 2013, which is, um, since many of you are from the nonprofit world, that you guys are the most innovative of all right now. Um, you have to be. So the things we're going to learn from you, the things that we're going to experiment with you guys, are things that we're going to be using in 2014 to win elections and win fights on Capitol Hill. So whether you work with Jim or me on any kind of nonprofit project, and you know, it, it's it's important to know that this is your opportunity to really be creative and not just follow our lead, but say, but ask hard questions. Jim. Yeah. No. no that I, that was actually pretty close to the point I was going to make. I, I I really want to make sure that this was uh, helpful to to you guys that are working with nonprofits because there there are a lot of examples that we could get into where, for instance, you know. We're running a campaign to look for donors, and on your donor page, you know, we're able to put a cookie on the actual donor page on your website. Well, over the course of the next couple of weeks, we can actually see a profile of the kind of people that are actually coming to your donation page. From there, we can actually model out exactly like what that person looks like on the internet, go into our, our 600 million browser cookies, and actually fish out the right donors. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to speak for these guys, but it, it is just true that the applications for a lot of this stuff actually started, you know, in organizations that weren't political, whether they were companies or even like large on top of this. Um, I know ARP did a bunch of this stuff a couple of years ago where they were trying to go out and find out, you know, who was actually, you know, up in the 65 plus or 60 plus or 55 plus universe who was actually on the internet and did a lot of work with Facebook and whatnot. I mean, a lot of these innovations have come out of the nonprofit space. And so it's really important that. You know, we are all we're in front of you at least explore applications and stuff to, to the work you do and make you guys more, more efficient and more effective um, at finding new members uh, if you're in your nonprofits, that's what you're going after. Finding donors, which is probably the most important thing. Uh, and then finally being more effective at communicating from a marketing standpoint that you normally would do with print or with whatever TV ads you're running or direct mail. So if you want if you want to follow any of the speakers panelists on Twitter, uh, Jim Walsh is Jim Walsh DC, uh, uh, Jordan is J S Lieberman, uh, and Waldo is at Waldo Tibbetts, and I'm at Dr Digipol, uh, as in Doctor of Digital Politics. Uh, yeah, I taught the world's first college course on in internet politics, so uh, let's. Uh, uh, so I think I, I earned that one. Um, so. Uh, that's who we are on on on, uh, on, um, on Twitter. Again, Jim Walsh's company is DS Political. Uh, Jordan is Campaign Grid, and Waldo is from Rocket Fuel. And uh, I'm sure uh, they're available to answer questions if you tweet at them. And uh, and we have a few minutes before we have to leave the room. So if you want to. Uh, uh, mill about and ask some questions, I'm sure there'll be some answers as well. We'll leave Jim logged in so that people can uh, walk up and, and say hi to him for a few minutes if Jim's okay with that. Waldo, is your last name? That, that's Tibbetts. T-I-B-B-E-T-T-S. Two T's at the end. Two T's. Thank you very much. This has been the Internet Advocacy Roundtable. We'll see you next month, third Thursday of the month. Thanks, Alan, for putting it together. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, everybody. Oh, we have to figure out time for next week. Hi, Jim. Hey. Thanks, Jim.